Well, let me again welcome you here to Big Valley Grace, especially if this is your uh, first time um, with us. Welcome to all of you that are uh, watching online. I'm going to have all of the, the guys that are here tonight stand up, okay? All the guys, if you're visiting with us, we have for the last couple of months just kind of been focusing on, on the men of our church and praying for them. In um, 1 Kings chapter 2, something interesting is happening, guys. King David is about ready to die. And for those of you that are visiting and maybe you don't know a lot about the Bible, David, um, King David was Israel's greatest king. There's more written in the Bible about King David than any other person. Kind of the defining verse that maybe captures his life is the Bible says that David, King David was a man after God's own heart. King David was, was just a great, great man. And he's about ready to die. Hospice is over at the palace. Okay? He's only got but a few words left. And he calls in one of his sons, Solomon. And you can imagine the scene, Solomon comes over to the bed and King David is now going to share his last thoughts with this particular son of his. Th th these are going to be some pretty weighty words. This is his, his last thought to his son Solomon. And it says, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm going to die. All of you that are standing, it's coming a moment. You're going to die. David's there. Be strong. I don't know if he reached up and grabbed his son's hand. I don't know if his son had his hand. I, I don't know if he could speak very loudly or not. But he says, be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commands, his rules and his testimonies as what is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do. In other words, a modern day translation, a New Testament translation might be, son, live out the word of God. And as I was thinking about this this afternoon, I, I was thinking about, you know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll have that opportunity like Solomon. I don't know how I'm going to go. You don't know how you're going to go, guys. But I was kind of envisioning, envisioning this moment. I, I, I'm there I am in the hospice bed, and I say, Cade, come in here. Get, get, get Cade in here. Get my kids in here. And I, I'm, I, I'm going. Maybe I look up at my kids and say, here's the deal, guys. Your dad's going to die. It's what happens to everybody. But I want all of you to be strong. I want you to be men. And Kate, I just don't want you to be any kind of man. I want you to be a man who takes serious the word of God. Who takes it so serious that he spends time reading it and studying it and memorizing it and meditating on it to the to the degree that he actually that you'd live it out. 
So th those would be some good words to say. But then, guys, I began to think about this. We're, 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 not, we're not dead yet. Some of you are so young, you don't have kids. Maybe you'll never have kids. I, I don't know. But I do know this. We're all still alive. And here's the deal. Wouldn't it be even better if you could look your son or your kids in the eye and say, just live like your old man lived? You just follow my example because you were living a godly life. You see, one of the things, if you don't know the story of David and Solomon, his son, is this. David was a man after God's own heart, and he loved God dearly. But he disobeyed God in some areas of his life. One of them was he had many wives, at least eight that we know of, because there's eight mentioned in Scripture. But he probably had many more. He had trouble with women. We all know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? And guess who grew up just like his daddy? Solomon. Solomon, I think, watched his dad just disobey God in an area. And he grew up disobeying God in that area of his life also. He had hundreds and hundreds of wives. Now, there were reasons why a king in that era would have had lots of wives, but it's no excuse for disobeying God. And men, as I pray for you now, I hope we all have that moment. I hope you all have a moment. You look your boy in the eye. Say, be strong, be a man. Live out the word. I hope we all get that moment, but here's the thing. Let's all begin, at least today, to live out the scriptures. So that if we don't get that moment, that our boys will be able to look at us, our children will be able to look at us, our spouses will be able to remember how we live today. And that our actions will, would speak much louder than our words, you see? You, you, you may have blown it horribly, but today is a new day, guys. See what I'm saying? Father, thank you for all of these men that are standing. That includes me. Give us all an opportunity to look our kids in the eye, maybe before we take our last breath, as King David did, and say, hey, come on, man. Don't blow this thing. Be strong. Be a man. Live out the word. But if we don't get that chance, God, may somehow all of us in this room that are standing who name the name of Christ, may we live it out. And maybe tonight's a night of repentance for many. But tonight they would go home and begin to live out the scriptures in front of their children, their sons. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, grab a seat, guys. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to two places, okay? 1 John chapter 4, and put your finger in there. And then I want you to put your finger in at Luke chapter 19, okay? 1 John chapter 4 and Luke chapter 19. These are two places I, I want you to see it in your own Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you want one, all you have to do is go into the altar room when we're done. We'll give you a Bible for free. It won't cost you a thing. We want to put in your hands the Word of God. Lots of crummy thoughts out there in the world. People are chasing their own tails out there, living all kinds of ways. I want to put in your hands God's Word that you might live according to the will of God, the Word of God. Nothing will blow your mind like living your life according to the Word of God. And if you need a Bible, go in there. But tonight, all the verses will be up on the Jumbotrons. I think they're even inside your, your, your program. So to set up where I really want to go tonight, let's look at 1 John chapter 4, okay? 1 John chapter 4. The Bible says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God, right? Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
Everybody say those three words together. God is love. Now, what does it mean that God is love? Well, it means that it's in God's very nature to love. In other words, God's love, you know, God loves not because he finds some object like human beings worthy of his love. He simply loves because it's in his very nature to love, which means this. I think I put it in your notes. God's love for you has nothing to do with you. How good or bad you are. God simply loves you because of who he is. You see, he is love. Love isn't just something he does for us or to us or some feeling he has for us. He is love, which means His love for you has nothing to do with you. Has nothing to do with how good you are, how crummy you are, how sinful you are. God just loves you simply because of who he is. And God proved this truth when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you on the cross. Romans chapter five says, but God demonstrated his own love for us, and this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for you. Some of you are are here right now, you're in this building, maybe you're watching online, and you don't believe in God, and yet he still loves you, because it has nothing to do with you. It's just who he is. He, He doesn't die on a cross because we're all a bunch of good people, you know. We were all sinful, we were were all apart from him. We'd all done a lot of really crummy things, said a lot of really crummy things, and here's God coming to planet Earth in the form of a human being, Jesus, and he's dying on a cross for us. Even though we don't want anything to do with him. He loves us because he is love. Think back to the song we just sang. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? What more could he give? He gave up his life. That that, that tells you that he loves you. what, 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 What more could he give up for you? There isn't anything he could give up. When he died on that cross and he's got his hands outstretched, he's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. Now the main character in the story we're gonna read tonight in Luke chapter 19 is named Zacchaeus. And he's gonna have a radical encounter with this God of love that will forever change his life. But before I read the story, I wanna look at one verse in Luke chapter 18, okay? We're, we're gonna read the story, this little vignette of the life of Jesus and, and Zacchaeus in chapter 19, but I wanna look at one verse in chapter 18. Verse 25 says, Jesus was talking, he says, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's weird. Maybe he's standing next to a camel and he's got all of his disciples here and there's this big, huge crowd there. Maybe he's got this camel he's leaning up against. And Jesus says, hey, I just want you to know something. It'd be easier for this camel right here to go through the eye of a needle than it is for wealthy people to get into the kingdom. He makes that statement, okay? Why is that? Why can wealth be, not always, but why can't it be a huge hindrance to getting to know God? Why is it so hard for prosperous people, wealthy people, to establish a relationship with God? Well, let me give you three reasons why. Number one, pride. 
Pride always keeps someone from God. Pride is always a huge barrier to an all-out surrender to God and his will. The Bible says that if you want to enter his forever kingdom, you've got to have the humility of a child. You've got to be able to fall on your knees before God and say, God, I'm sorry for leaving you out of my life. I'm sorry that I've, I've blown you off. I need you. I want you. I don't want to live apart from you anymore. I need your help, God. I surrender render my life over to you. I repent of my sin. Please forgive me of my sin. I don't want to be the CEO of my life anymore. That hasn't worked out too good. I want you to be the CEO of my life. And that just takes humility. And for whatever reason, people with a lot of wealth have a hard time doing that. Uh, n- n- number two, false security. Here's the temptation if you're wealthy and everything's going well in your life. You start thinking, you know what? My money can buy me out of trouble. My my ability can work me out of trouble. My mind can think me out of trouble. My insurance can pay my way out of trouble. You know, I'm covered. Why do I need God? And number three, false conclusions. This is a huge one. Here's the thinking behind this one. Hey, pastor, if I'm so bad, why is my life so good? I mean, God must really like me because look at my life. It's so wonderful. I have everything I've dreamed of. I got money, a family, a big house, two big houses, good friends, a new fancy car. God must really like me. Beloved, when Jesus said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, it blew everybody away. That was a radical statement because it was assumed in, during biblical days that a rich person had a front row seat in heaven. In fact, right after Jesus makes this statement, his disciples said, said, Who can be saved then? Because they had drawn this false conclusion. They thought that if you had money and houses and ski doos and all the stuff, then God must really have his hand on your life. That's certainly a sign that God has blessed you. And so all of a sudden, here you have Jesus in Luke chapter 18 going, hey, It's easier for this camel to make its way through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. It just blew everybody's mind. And that's why they said, well, then who can be saved? I mean, if rich people don't get in, if rich people can't get into heaven, well, then who who makes it? You see, the disciples had drawn the false conclusion that wealth equaled God's blessing, which isn't necessarily true. It can be true. Now with this pronouncement fresh on the minds of his followers, remember, camel, I, they must have been standing on pins and needles waiting to hear what was gonna happen when Jesus had this one-on-one, up close and personal encounter with this rich man, this wealthy man named Zacchaeus. Remember, Luke 18, camel, I, now, Here's this moment, okay? So you got the setting, okay? Let's read Luke chapter 19. Look at verse one. Jesus entered Jericho, and he made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed up a sycamore uh, fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus into his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He, 
Jesus has gone to the house and is going to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. If I have cheated people on their taxes, and he had, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Wow. Wow, that's, a, that's just a powerful story. We've all read that story, right? Most of us in this room probably heard that story, read that story. I've, I've talked about that story, I don't know how many times. So here you got this man, Zacchaeus, who hears that Jesus is in town and he wants to see him. Obviously, he's heard all kinds of things about him. He's certainly heard that Jesus was a great teacher. He's heard that nobody teaches like Jesus, right? He's heard that Jesus was a man with great power. He had heard, I'm sure, about all the miracles that Jesus was doing. He heard that Jesus had healed people. He heard that Jesus was a, a man with great authority. He heard that Jesus had ticked off the religious leaders. He's heard all of this, so he simply wants to go see what he looks like. He wants to see Jesus in person, but he's got a huge problem. Everybody hates him. Nobody likes this guy. They hate him because he's a crooked tax collector. There are people that would love to stick a knife in his back and for him to see Jesus, he's gotta go out and make his way through a huge crowd. He's gotta go out in public you know, places among all the people he's been ripping off for years. But he makes the decision to chance it. He makes the decision to go into a crowded public place, a hostile place, I'm sure he was nervous and on edge, always looking around because nobody liked him. But seeing Jesus was worth the risk. So he's hiding behind some trees, darting from one to another, just hoping to get a glimpse of him. And can, I mean, just picture this. The streets are packed full of people. And here's this little guy you know, little Danny DeVito, you know, just trying to figure out where he's at. He's hiding behind a tree and a limb and just trying to, he can't see over the crowd. He's nervous. Is someone going to jab a knife in my back? Unbelievable scene. So he hikes up his robe and he scampers up a tree like a little kid. He's a grown man climbing up a tree. And now he's out on a limb where everybody could see him. And I'm sure that everyone in the crowd was wondering, what in the world is Zacchaeus doing up in that tree? What's that ripoff doing up, up in that tree? What's Danny DeVito doing up there, man? I mean, that's weird. What's going on here? I mean, here's this wealthy, professional businessman, you know, preached out on a limb, straining to see Jesus. Get, get, get the picture? Reminds me of being at Disneyland when the parade's going by. Remember that? Remember those days? I remember when my kids were little. You go to Disneyland, nee, 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 and the light thing's going by, and Daffy Duck's going by, but there's about 10 rows back, and what do you do? You got your kid up on your, on your thing, he's on your shoulders, and trying to get a view of you know, the, the, the parade. That, that's what's happening here. The parade's going by. It's Jesus and the streets are jammed up full of people and here's this little guy, Zacchaeus, up in a tree just trying to see, just trying to see Jesus walk by. That's all he wants to do. Hey, who, I gotta see this guy who everybody's talking about. I gotta see this guy who, who's done miracles. I gotta see this guy who, who's got all the religious leaders all up in arms. I gotta see who this guy is. Now the day probably started like most days for Zacchaeus. He rolled out of his bed, you know, and he walks into his bathroom, brushes his teeth, washes his face, you know, combs his hair. But when he looks in the mirror, 
on this particular day, I, I don't think he, he liked what he saw. I think something's starting to happen in his life. Years of ripping people off had taken a huge toll on his life. Years of being an outcast in society had taken its toll. Years of always having to look over his shoulder, wondering if somebody was gonna take him out, had worn him down. You see, in those days, for a Jew to be a tax collector made him a thief and a traitor. You were a thief because tax collecting wasn't regulated like it is today. And so he could just take a bunch of money from all of these Jews and then he'd pocket a whole bunch of it and then he'd give a little bit to the Roman government. And everybody knew that's why this guy was so wealthy. And he was a traitor because he was actually a Jew collecting taxes for the Romans. The Jews hated the Romans. And so here you got this Jewish guy collecting money for the Romans and handing that money over to the Romans and everybody knew he was padding his own pockets full of money. This guy's hated. And what made it even worse was that he wasn't simply a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector, which means he didn't go out and, and uh, you know, let, let's just say you didn't pay your taxes. He, he didn't show up at your door, hey, listen, you haven't paid your taxes. You know what he did? He had a bunch of henchmen. It was like the mob. He, he'd tell, you know, Jimmy the Thumb, Hey, once you go over so and so's house, he hadn't paid his taxes, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a knock on the door, and somebody get beaten up to get the taxes. Here's a Jew sending other Jews out to rough up Jews to get taxes so that the money could be given to the Romans. This guy was hated. Nobody liked this guy. So according to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, Zacchaeus' chances of having his heart changed and thus getting into the kingdom of God were very slim because he is a very, very wealthy man. Okay? So what happened? What happened in the heart of Zacchaeus that caused him to change when so many others don't? Well, probably a lot of things, but I'm gonna give you two. Okay, two things that Zacchaeus did that totally changed his life. Okay, and the first one is this. Zacchaeus was wise enough to realize that something was missing in his life. I mean, he didn't have to leave his house that day. He could have stayed home. He could have said, man, I don't need to, I don't need to go out there, man. I got everything I need right here. In fact, if I'm going to leave, I'm going to get out and I'm going to go to my other house somewhere else. I like my house. I got servants. I got food. I got wine. I don't need to leave my house. I got my 62 inch, you know, plasma up on the wall. Why do I need to leave? So what, Jesus is coming through town. I don't care who that guy is. But for whatever reason, that day, something was going down and he was wise enough to go, hey look, I, I don't know. I think I'm gonna chance, I'm gonna go see who this guy is. No one preaches like him. He's talking about things that nobody else is talking about, man. I, I, I wanna go just see him. That, 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 that's wise. I think that's a wise decision that he makes that day. I think Zacchaeus had a house full of stuff, but his heart was empty. Most of his life, he paid attention to power and position and, I don't know, portfolios. He, he'd probably, you know, do anything, literally anything, to earn an extra buck or two. I'm sure he would have even sacrificed his own family to make a few more bucks, to get a few more dollars in his paycheck. Sound familiar? Zacchaeus had everything money could buy. He was a man that had traded his eternal soul for prosperity. But on this particular afternoon, everything changed. He was smart enough to realize that something was missing in his life. And it was something that all of his money couldn't buy. 
Jesus said this in Mark chapter eight. He said, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but you lose your soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? Well, uh, okay, okay, so you, you, you got a house here, right? Okay, good. You got a house up in Tahoe? Okay, great. You got a house over on the coast? Okay, great. You got a house on the East Coast? You got great. Okay, you got cars? Yeah, you got, you got all this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, what if you lost your soul tonight? What good would it all do you? No, nothing wrong with having multiple homes. Nothing wrong with having multiple cars. Nothing wrong with any of that. But man, in the culture we live in, everybody's chasing that stuff. Everybody. I got, I got more stuff than the average person. The, the other day I mentioned that I had one pair of jeans, remember? And some of you are probably going, hey. You got, a, you got a new pair of jeans. Yeah, my friend, Ben Miller, sitting right out there. He bought them for me. <laughs> he did, not, no joke. Hey, look, hey, look, I got one pair. That's all, I, like I told you, it's all I need. I need one pair of jeans, that's it. I wear it all week, wash them on Friday, they're good for the weekend, and then I'm good. I, I, I literally, I'm not kidding you, I got, that's no joke. Now, I still got the other one that Ben hated, you know, it started to rip, and... <laughs> now, that doesn't mean I don't collect other things. I, I, I like the Tommy Bahama. I got a lot of Tommy Bahama. I could just wear one shirt all week long, but I don't. I got lots of shirts, lots of, lots of Tommy Bahama shirts. I like them. I love those things. <laughs> Point is, is this. Nothing wrong with having stuff. That's not what Jesus is saying here in Mark 8. All he's saying is, is this. Listen, have you given any consideration to your soul? You, you've gained it all. You got it all. But along the way, what happened here? I, I, think, I think this is Zacchaeus. He had gained it all, man. He had all kinds of dough. This was a wealthy man. But he didn't track his soul. And his soul was just empty. He could have gone out and bought another house. And by the way, you know who in the Bible really n nails what I'm saying here? Solomon, right? Solomon had houses and vineyards and cities. I mean, this guy had it all. But his soul was empty. There came a moment when he forgot about all the things that God had taught him. And he gets to the point and says, vanity, vanity. All is but vanity. And his life was a mess. And Jesus has given us a warning here. What, what, what do you benefit if you gain it all? Jesus also said this in Luke chapter 12. He said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Okay? You, your net worth has nothing to do with your self-worth. They're two different things. He told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And this farmer said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know. I'll give it away to the poor. He didn't say that. I know, I'll take it down to the gospel mission. Nah. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. Then I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Here was a guy who was thinking about one thing and one thing only, himself. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. He's not saying you can't store up wealth. He's just saying, listen, along the way of storing up wealth, do you have a rich relationship with God? Or has somehow along the way of 
gaining all of this wealth? Have you, have you lost something? Have you lost your relationship with God? Now, I don't think Zacchaeus ever had one. But I think that's the case with Zacchaeus. I think he had barns and barns and barns of stuff. But he didn't have a rich relationship with God. And that morning, he's looking in a mirror, and for whatever reason, you know, I gotta, I, I don't know, I'm gonna go talk to this Jesus guy. I'm just, just gonna see him. Something, something was missing. Which brings me to the second thing that Zacchaeus did that I think changed his life, and that is that Zacchaeus was wise enough to go seek out Jesus. Look at verse three. Zacchaeus tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. He, 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 he went to seek out Jesus. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, pastor. I thought you said the Bible said that nobody seeks after God, right? And you would be right. Romans chapter three says this. There is no one righteous, no, not one. There's no one who understands and there's nobody who seeks after God. That's how powerful sin is. Sin is so powerful that nobody seeks out God. Your flesh without the Holy Spirit in it is in complete control. And the last thing your flesh wants is for you to go seek out God or seek out you know, salvation or seek Jesus. Nobody's wise enough to seek after God on their own. But here's what happens. God begins to draw a person to himself. God begins to work in a life. He, he begins to tug at a heart, right? I, I think God is doing that right now in some of your lives. I believe that. Jesus said this in John chapter six, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me to them, or to me. Sin is such a diabolical force, the only way any one of us ever get to God is simply because Jesus begins to do a work in our lives. And sometimes Jesus uses us Sometimes the Holy Spirit has us invite a friend to church. Sometimes the Holy Spirit uses us to draw somebody to himself. I, I was thinking back to how many people God used to Christians that God used to draw me to himself. Look, when God begins to draw a person, at that moment, that person has a choice to make. They either seek out what God's doing within their lives, or they blow God off, and they harden their hearts to God's drawing. And beloved, this is what's going on in the life of Zacchaeus. The love of God was drawing him. The love of God was tugging at his heart, and Zacchaeus made the choice a wise choice to find out what was going on. And he knew that Jesus somehow was the key. And nothing was going to stop him from seeing Jesus. Nothing. If I get stabbed, I get stabbed. If I get beat up, I get beat up. If somebody makes fun of me for climbing up a tree, uh, I'm made fun of. It doesn't matter to me because it's worth it. He's worth it. Now what happens next is just really beautiful. Here's Jesus walking down the street and it says this in verse five. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Hey Zacchaeus, quick come down. I, I must be a guest in your home today. And Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone. Be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. I love this picture of Jesus going to the home of a notorious sinner. I love that. I mean, this guy was, was evil. The, you, you just go home and Google, you know, tax collectors back in biblical days. They, they were bad people. This is one bad person. 
He had thought a lot of bad things. He had said a lot of bad things. He had done a lot of bad things. And everybody knew it. And here's Jesus going to his house for lunch. The house of a notorious sinner. Man, I love that. I also love the picture of everybody else standing on the outside of his home, staring on in disbelief. And their question was this. Why would Jesus go into the home of such a notorious sinner? They're, they're all standing there going, you gotta be kidding me. That guy's been ripping me off for decades. In fact, he came to my house one day and he beat me to a pulp to get my tax money. That's one bad, evil dude. And here he is in his house having lunch. Why would Jesus go into the home of such a notorious sinner? And the answer is this. Jesus will enter wherever he's welcome. There are some of you here. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to Jesus. You, have made, you might have made just a royal mess of your entire life. You may look back to your earliest memories and think to yourself, man, I have messed up since I can remember. I've made one bad decision after another bad decision after another bad decision. I have been involved in some crummy, sinful, evil things. My husband hates me. My wife hates me. My kids hate me. No one likes me. I don't even like myself. But Jesus will enter wherever he's welcome. Doesn't matter what you've been doing. Doesn't matter what the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years have been about. Doesn't matter. You open your heart to him. You invite him in. And he'll come in. You simply open your heart to Jesus despite your past, despite your reputation, despite your failures, despite your successes. You invite Jesus into your life, he'll come in. Of all the people in the crowd that day, you almost have to scratch your head and think, why did Zacchaeus pop up on Jesus' radar screen? Why did Jesus make Zacchaeus the object of his love at that moment? After all, he was the worst man in the crowd. He was the, the crummiest sinner in the crowd. Why Zacchaeus? I'll tell you why. It's because Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was the hungriest guy in the crowd. As Jesus was walking down, and here were all these people saying all kinds of stuff, he knew he was God, he's sovereign, and he knew that guy on that tree limb is hungry. He could have stopped and talked to anybody, but he didn't. Because I don't think anybody else there really wanted Jesus the way Zacchaeus wanted Jesus. Zacchaeus was the most ready to have his heart and life changed by God's amazing love in the crowd, and that's exactly what happened. Now, we don't know what they discussed over lunch, but whatever it was, this lost sheep found his shepherd. And this shepherd found one of his lost sheep. Because Zacchaeus emerged from this lunch, a brand new person, it was a transformational moment. Look at verse eight. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I'll give half my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Now, remember, Zacchaeus is still learning. He, if I have, Lord, I'm sure the Lord was kind of looking at him like, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, you, you have. You know, he's still a human. He's still got his flesh to deal with. He's still trying to, you know, whiz one by the Lord here. I'm glad I've never done that. <laughs> Look, when you read verse eight, it's unbelievable. 
I mean, it's unbelievable what we read. We've just seen a man instantly changed by the love of God. Here's this greedy, conniving, rip-off trader giving half of all he had away to the poor. Zacchaeus' servants had to have fainted right there on the spot. Standing before them was a brand new creation. One Bible scholar said this, he said, quote, right here, the camel passed through the needle's eye and Jesus stood and cheered. Isn't that a great quote? Man, that's just a great quote right there, man. I just love that. Now I want you to listen to me. Zacchaeus wasn't transformed because he gave all his money back or half his money back. He, 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 he didn't, you know, become a part of God's family because he was gonna give back, you know, four times as much as he had ripped people off. That, that's not why he was saved. Your good works don't save you. All those good works show you is that something genuinely had happened in his life. He literally was, 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 was being changed. Now let me quickly say this, because I'm good at this. When you dig into this passage, you discover that there's a really dark part of the story. <laughs> Well, one person is being forgiven, Zacchaeus, right? Then his past is being washed away, and he's being reconciled to God. Woo! There are others who are angry that Jesus would be so free with his love. Look, look, look at verse 7. But the people were displeased. Oh, great! His sins have been forgiven. Oh, great! He's no longer going to hell. He's going to be in heaven. Oh, this is fantastic! This is an ugly scene. I believe that as Jesus walked towards Zacchaeus, this crowd of people began to think to themselves, yes, this crooked tax collector is finally gonna get what he deserved, right? They were convinced that, that Jesus was gonna give you know, Zacchaeus a tongue lashing. I mean, this is the perfect moment in their opinion for Jesus to point his finger at Zacchaeus and give him the old wrath of God is on your head sermon, right? <laughs> Crowd was livid. Absolutely livid when Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down, let's have lunch together. Beloved, I want you to know something. That's the Jesus I want you to know. If you're here and you don't know the Lord, that's the Jesus I want you to know. The Jesus who sees all the stuff in your life. And you say, oh, Jesus, come in. Come have lunch with me. And he comes. He comes into your life and he has lunch with you, if you will. Doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus said this in verse 10, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus was lost. I remember when I was lost. Some of you have been saved so long, you don't, you don't even remember when you were lost in your sin, headed for a Christless eternity. You, 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 were, you, you were Zacchaeus. And you've walked with God so long, you, you forgot about that. Some of you need to remember back before you knew him. You need to remember back to those days when for whatever reason, God began to draw you to himself. Remember what an incredible moment that was. Jesus came to save goofed up people. He came to save those who didn't have it all together. He came to save the crooks of the world, if you will. So off goes the, the crowd in one direction, griping and grumbling, and off goes Zacchaeus with Jesus in the other direction to have lunch. Wow. And it was all because Zacchaeus opened his heart up to Jesus. I'm gonna tell you what this story screams as I wrap it up, okay? The story screams don't ever give up on somebody, don't ever give up hope on those that you know and love. I mean, if you would have been in Jericho that day and you would have gone around and taken a survey of, you know, uh, of the people and asked, who's the most likely man to have you know, his life made new? Who's the most likely person in town to be changed by God? It would have been a unanimous vote 
that rip off tax collector is a kiss. There's no hope for him. He's a notorious sinner. Nobody would have thought that that afternoon that guy would get saved. Nobody. And this is what I want you to do. Inside your program, um, there's, a, there's a card. It looks like this, okay? Why don't you pull that card out? And Easter's in a couple of weeks, okay? Who, who, who are the Zacchaeuses in your life? Who are the notorious sinners? Write their names on here, their first names. Maybe they're not notorious sinners. Maybe it's, you know, grandma. She just doesn't know the Lord. Maybe grandma is a notorious sinner. I don't know. Uh, I've met a few. Anyway, um, just who, who doesn't know the Lord in your life? Who's out there that you, maybe you've given up praying for them. You, you, you tried to get him here for Christmas and they wouldn't come. And all of a sudden, I'm reminding you of that person. I want you to write their names on this card. And we're going to take these cards as a staff and we're going to be praying for them for Easter. But I want you to write their name. I want you to go, oh man, I'll, all right, I'll put them down, my boss. All right, I'll, I'll put them down, my uncle. Ah oh, man, there's no way, but I've tried to get them in church. Just write their names down. And in just a little bit, you'll walk by these little connect boxes and you drop them in there. We'll collect them all up. We'll collect these up tonight, tomorrow. And we as a staff, I'll even take them to the elder board meeting tomorrow night or Monday night, and I'll have our elders. We'll, 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 we'll believe with you. We'll pray the names on these cards. Maybe they would come at Easter, and like Zacchaeus, lives would, would be changed. Look, Big Valley Grace is filled with people who just five years ago or three years ago or two years ago or last week would have said, you'll never catch me in church. I, I, I won't go to church. I'll never give my life to Jesus Christ. And something began to happen in their souls, right? Some of you, well, every one of you in this room, there was a moment when you didn't want anything to do with God and God began to do a work. And here you are. The story proves that God cares deeply about people, about you, and he's ready to come over to your house and be a part of your life. God hasn't given up on you. Others may have given up on you. You may feel like everybody's given up on you. Your family may have given up on you. Your spouse may have given up on you. Your parents may have given up on you. But I'm here to tell you, this story says that God hadn't given up on you. I think God right now is looking up in the tree and he's calling your name. He's pursuing you right now for some of you. You're, you're up in a tree branch. And God's saying, hey, let's have lunch. Would have been a way different story if Zacchaeus would have gone, nah, no thanks. I just wanted to see you. I just wanted to hear the great music you had at your church. I heard you were a loud, weird guy, and it's confirmed. I, 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 I don't want, I, I, I don't want to, I, I'm just going to stay up on the branch. Zacchaeus could have done that. No, thank you. People do it every day. People do it every moment. But you might be here and you're going, I think God's doing something in my life. I think God's drawing. I, I think God's calling my name. You, you just know it in here. Zacchaeus just knew it. You just, you just know it. And here's all you got to do. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to be done. And you can walk through those doors into the altar room, and our pastors, our elders will be in there. And all you got to do is walk in and go, I need to know the Lord. And they'll pray with you. And you can walk out of this building just like Zacchaeus walked out of his house, a different person. Because God will come into your life. And he'll forgive you of your sins. The love of God will begin to transform your life. You may not be able to fix the past. Sometimes our sin and junk is so goofed up the past you can't fix it. But you can walk out of here today a new man, a new woman. You can do that. Why don't you stand up?
And so, Lord, I sure have enjoyed tonight. Having all the kids here was great, man. That's just, I just know what it's going to do in their lives. I know what it did in my own personal life, and I was an adult. My life was, was just transformed on those trips. Blessings on them. Thank you for those that were baptized. They were obedient. Lord, blessings on them. I'm thankful we could come and sing some sacred music together, bring our gifts to you together. And now, Lord, if there be one Zacchaeus in the house here tonight, one person who knows that they're being drawn by you right now, may they make their way into the altar room. May that be like Zacchaeus climbing down a tree. May they just make their way into the altar room. God, thank you for your goodness to us, and I pray these things in your name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, Lord bless you. Okay, live for Jesus.